As you can see, this is Kent Hovind. This is seminar three. If you haven't seen the other parts to this, don't sweat it. You can see these out of order if you want. I try to make them independent of each other. In part 3A, he was trying to convince us that dinosaurs are actually dragons or dragons are dinosaurs and dinosaurs are mentioned all through the Bible and blah. It's just all nonsense, complete nonsense. Anyway, let's continue on from here and uh, see what he has to say for himself, shall we? What, what made the dinosaurs go extinct? Do you realize they're asking the wrong question? The question is not what made them go extinct. The question is, did they go extinct? Yes. See, the liberals are always real good at getting us to argue about the wrong subject. They're always asking me, should we have creation taught in public schools? I say, that's a good question, and I will be glad to discuss that. However, there's another question we should ask first, okay? The real question is, should we have public schools? Oh my God, the dude is going down this road. Should we have public schools? Okay, go on, I'm listening. Mm -hmm. Let's argue that one for a while first, okay? And if we're going to have them, then we'll discuss what should be taught in them and who decides what is taught in them. I mean, does Bill Clinton decide what's taught, or does Osama bin Laden decide what's taught, or maybe you should decide, maybe I should decide. See, the whole problem is, some people have this idiot idea that children belong to the state. Uh, I don't know who believes that, but okay. No, no, no. You see, children belong to God, and they are entrusted to parents. And the parents should decide what God wants them to be taught. The state... Okay, um, if that's the case, then you can homeschool your kid legally. I completely disagree. You should be beholden to certain standards. Kids should be expected to be able to read at a certain age. They should be, uh, they should be able to write and do a certain level of math at a certain age. And it should be standardized across the entire country. Every kid should be able to do certain things. That's how we create an educated population. But you know people like this don't like having an educated population. It does not ever have any children. Now let me step back just a little to listen again. <clears throat> parents. And the parents should decide what God wants them to be taught. The state does not ever have any children. It is sterile, okay? It can't have children. Okay, so they want to steal yours. This is just weird, dude. This is just a weird ideology. It's getting super political. Another long, interesting story. But anyway, the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution says the federal government only has certain very limited powers and anything else is left to the states. The federal government has no business being involved in education or welfare or hurricane relief or anything else. Oh, yeah. Um, that's simply untrue and inaccurate. Uh, it actually does have a right to be involved in a lot of this stuff. I saw this, I think, yesterday somewhere. Somebody was talking about Texas seceding from the United States. Uh, not going to happen, by the way. It completely lost cause. If Texas actually did secede from the United States, like they've been talking about for decades, the U.S. would nationalize the National Guard, the Texas National Guard, and occupy Texas just like that. They have no legal right to exit the United States. But that's beside the point. The point that I'm trying to get at here is, as it turns out, Kent Hovind, I believe, renounced his citizenship at one point. Let me just look it up on his Wikipedia page here. Oh, this is his mugshot from 2002 on the right. Wow. Uh, let's see. Renouncing citizenship. I'm looking for... He's a sovereign citizen. Yeah, here we go. He's a sov he calls him or at the time at the very least, he called himself a sovereign citizen who didn't believe in filing taxes and all kinds of stuff. You see, on March 1st, 1996, Hoven filed a chapter 13 bankruptcy petition to avoid paying federal income taxes, claiming he was not a citizen of the United States and that he did not earn income. He claimed that as a minister, everything he owned belonged to God and he was not subject to paying taxes for doing God's work. On June 5th, 1996, the court dismissed Hoven's bankruptcy case, finding he had lied about his possessions and income. The court upheld the IRS's determination that his claim was filed in bad faith for the sole purpose of avoiding payment of federal income taxes and called Hoven's arguments patently absurd. 
It also said that the IRS has no record of the debtor ever having filed a federal income tax return. Oh, my God. In 1998, the IRS requested account information about Hovind from an internet provider after Hovind made claims on an internet broadcast about his own tax law noncompliance going back to the 1970s. When the provider initially balked, the courts granted a subpoena on the basis that the IRS could demonstrate that Hovind had received income but had filed no income tax returns going back to 1991. Wow. In 2003, Hovind would tell the New York Times, I haven't filed a tax return in 30 years. I don't know how he got away with that. How did he get away with not filing a tax return in 30 years? The IRS has two copies of every transaction. When I get money from YouTube, for example, or Patreon or whatever, not only do I have to file that with the IRS, but the IRS already got a copy of it from Patreon. If Patreon, so Patreon is paying me, you know, I, whatever. The, Patreon pays me like $5,000 or something per year, right? They send me the, the, that $5,000 and they tell the IRS, hey, this five grand just went to this person, so don't tax us for that. If they don't tell the IRS it's coming to me, they have to pay the taxes on it. So when they send me the money, they say to the IRS, we just sent the money to this guy, don't tax us for it, tax him. Now, when I file taxes, I can tell them, look, I just spent like $100 on this 3D printer, it was a business expense, and it went to this company. So I don't have to pay taxes on that $100 because it's a business expense. So the IRS goes to the 3D printing company and says, this guy says he spent $100 on you. What did you spend it on? Everybody gets taxed down the line. And if you're not telling the IRS who you sent the money to, they're taxing you. They're, they're charging you the taxes that they should be paying. So basically, the IRS has two records of every single transaction in the United States. Every transaction. How did Kent Hovind get away with not paying taxes for 30 years. The IRS had records showing his social security number received that money. To receive a paycheck, you have to give somebody your social security number or they're going to be paying taxes for you. I just don't get how he got away with this for so long. I really don't. Somebody was paying his taxes for him. It's crazy. No business at all. If you want to see why the schools went public, Get this many good articles, one by Samuel Blumenfeld that's incredible about why we have a public school system. It's all part of the plan for a new world order. Oh, my God. Here we go. He buys into every conspiracy theory out there, doesn't he? Big part of the plan. Get our college class, CSE 102. I teach college classes on creation where we go into much more detail, you know, chase every rabbit and kick every dog, and you can get that if you get time. But anyway, dinosaurs getting off the ark had a very difficult time. The climate had changed. Things were different. Remember, before the flood, they lived to be 900. Read your Bible. After the flood... Complete nonsense. People did not live to be 900. They only lived to be 400. And then... Oh, so he's saying that, like, average age slowly decreased as we got further, like, removed from God's glory or whatever. Is that, is that what he's telling us? Be 900. Read your Bible. After the flood, they only lived to be 400. And no. then 200. And then 100. Something changed. No. Well, for one thing, that canopy overhead was gone. Number two, the soil was... Yeah, there's a reference to canopy theory again. I already explained what canopy theory was in a previous part, so let past me explain it for me. There's this thing called canopy theory, okay? And canopy theory is the claim that there is a gigantic ice... Like, not an ice sheet that surrounded the Earth, but like an ice dome that encases the earth right it completely encases it and by encasing the earth kent Hovind claims that it increased the barometric uh, barometric pressure and it also increased the amount of oxygen that was on the earth and a combination of an oxygen-rich environment 
and more air pressure made things gigantic at the time. He believes that this ice canopy was the direct result of, you know, lizards, basically little salamanders and stuff, growing gigantic, which turned into dinosaurs. Seriously, I'm, I'm not joking. That's really what he believes. And he thinks that eventually the ice canopy melted, which caused the flood. And even he acknowledges that wouldn't be enough water to cover the entire planet. He also claims that water shot out from under the earth, like basically came out of geysers, underwater geysers and stuff. Completely ridiculous. There's no basis for any of the stuff that he claims. But that is canopy theory. It's mislabeled a theory. It does not deserve the title of theory, to be perfectly honest. Well, for one thing, that canopy overhead was gone. Number two, the soil was now not loaded with minerals like it's supposed to be to have plants grow like crazy. And the atmospheric pressure was different. The canopy had collapsed. It was gone, I believe. Sunlight was now getting through, radiation, etc. Much, Many more problems in the post-flood environment. Dinosaurs had two problems. Number one, the climate change. Number two, was probably worse, people hunted them. They killed them. Oh, wait a minute. So... Is he saying dinosaurs survived the flood? It sounds like that's what he's telling us, right? He thinks that dinosaurs survived the flood. A lot of people point out the fact that like, there are no dinosaurs' remains. Or, there's no indication that dinosaurs were like ever around after Noah's flood. Like Even creationists say that. But I, this guy, I guess, has... A unique belief as far as creationists go. Interesting. They killed him. Now, they didn't call him dinosaur, though. They called him dragon. Okay. See, the word dinosaur wasn't made up till 1841. So for most of human history, these creatures are called dragons. Did you know dinosaur is not even in the dictionary in 1891? For most of human history, they were known as dragons. Now, dra dragons are mentioned in the Bible 34 times. Okay, that's nonsense. Once again, don't believe anything out of the guy's mouth. I I'm not even sure if that's when the word dinosaur was invented, but I know that like dinosaurs' remains were not discovered until fairly recently. When were dinosaurs first discovered? About 1677, Robert Plott is credited with discovering the first dinosaur bone, but his best guess as to what it belonged to was a giant human. It wasn't until William Buckland, the first professor of geology at Oxford University, that a dinosaur fossil was correctly identified for what it was. Fascinating. What were dinosaurs called before 1841? This is from uh, nhm.ac.uk. Until 1842, no one had heard the word dinosaur, but when acclaimed anatomist Richard Owen grouped three prehistoric animals with curious features in common, he changed the way the world thought about fossil reptiles. According to americanscientist.org, First dinosaur to ever have been found was found in the village of Cornwell in Oxfordshire. It was the distal end of a femur. There is no evidence whatsoever that dinosaurs were called dragons in the Bible or that dinosaurs existed in the Bible or anything at all. So just a little fun fact check for you there. People say, why aren't dinosaurs in the Bible? Last night I'm talking to this lady at the counter at the hotel. She said, well, dinosaurs aren't in the Bible. I said, that's correct. That word wasn't made up till 1841. And if you got the right Bible, that was translated 1611. So, of course, you're not going to find that word in there. Uh, if you've got the right Bible. He believes King James is the correct version. I don't know why he thinks that. It's antiquated. They didn't have the, type, the, they didn't have the kinds of resources or information or anything that we have today. I honestly have no clue why... He believes King James Version to be the best. It's simply not. The King James Version sucks. It's terrible, honestly. Uh, but, you know, that's another story for another day. Uh, but they called them dragons. Dragons are listed in the dictionary in 1946 as now rare. Now rare? What? The dictionary is refuting the word usage? Oh, okay. I, I think I see what you're saying. You're saying that the dictionary was saying that we shouldn't be using the word dragon or whatever. Interesting. Okay. 
As the population of people began to grow after the flood, the population of dragons began to go down because nobody wants to live next door to a dragon. That's weird because, again, in a previous part, Kent claimed that dinosaurs were simply salamanders who, being affected by high barometric pressure and a high oxygen environment, never stopped growing. He believes that salamanders are actually what dinosaurs were. But again, he seems to be changing his tune now. He ch he's changing his story. It seems like he's actually contradicting what he said in previous parts. Same thing happened in Cobb County, Georgia, where Atlanta is today. Do you realize how many grizzly bears there are roaming around the woods right now near Atlanta, Georgia? Zero. Do you know how many there were just 300 years ago? Hundreds. What happened to the grizzly bears in Cobb County, Georgia? Well, as people move in and civilize an area, the big ferocious animals are killed off or driven off. Happens everywhere. If it came on the evening news tonight that there were five grizzly bears roaming around Cobb County, do you know what would happen by 6 o'clock in the morning? They'd all be dead. Because every redneck in four states would be out there with a rifle trying to shoot one. Right? Oh, my God. Now people are yelling in the background. Oh, yeah. Ugh. God. Ken Tovin's audience is full of rednecks, isn't it? And whoever could shoot the biggest one would be a hero. They'd have his picture on the front page. Hey, Bubba shot the grizzly bear and saved the village. Yeah, he did. <laughs> well, that's exactly what happened to the dragons. Man, if you could figure out a way to kill a dragon, they'd be telling stories about you around the campfire from now on. Well, great. Then we should see evidence of that, right? We should be able to find, like, the bones of all of these supposed dragons all over the place. And it should reflect what you're saying. We should be able to find them in the same layer of rock as we find rabbits. Is that correct? Because they were hunting dinosaurs and rabbits simultaneously? Because people and dinosaurs live together? You know, that's actually one of the falsifiable claims that the theory of evolution makes. If we found a rabbit in the Precambrian era of the geological column, it would indicate that evolution is false. Every theory has to have falsifiable qualities about it. It has to be able to be proven incorrect. Every single theory. Evolution, one of evolution's falsifiable qualities is if we find a rabbit skeleton in the Precambrian era of the geologic column, it means there's some aspect of evolution that needs to be modified to account for that because obviously... It doesn't work the way that we thought it did. Guess what we have never found? We've never found a rabbit skeleton in the Precambrian era. Never. Not once. If what you're saying is true, Kent, it would falsify evolution, actually. We have never found evidence of it. Not one time. Ever. People kill dragons for meat because they were a menace to prove you're a hero, to prove you're superior, competition for land, or for medicinal purposes. Many ancient recipes call for dragon blood, dragon bones, dragon saliva. And you think that actually did something? You think that worked? Unironically, you really think that? This dude is either a complete snake oil salesman, a charlatan to the core, or one of the most gullible people alive. It has to be one of the two. Why? Gilgamesh is famous for slaying a dragon. A Chinese legend tells about a guy named Yu that surveyed the land of China. It says after the flood, he surveyed the land and divided it into sections. He built channels to drain the water off to the sea and make the land livable again. Many snakes and dragons were driven from the marshlands. Yeah, that's just normal. If you want to build a city, you got to, you know, drive off the dragons and then build your city. I mean, it was expected. You got to drive the dragons off. Okay. Okay. Well, show us the skeletons of these dragons. Complete nonsense. You can't make claims without evidence. Or if you do, you can't expect people to believe it. Why would the Chinese calendar have 11 real animals, you know, the pig, the duck, the dog, and a dragon? Because of their mythology, that's why. They had a, a big mythology around all of these creatures. 
the pig, the dog, the duck, the chicken. In their mythology, they all mean something very specific. The year of the dragon, the year of the dog, the year of the snake, so on and so forth. It all has very specific meanings. Kentovin is just looking for flimsy reasons to believe that dragons are actually dinosaurs, and he's doing a piss poor job of it, in my opinion. Why would they put a mythical animal in there? Why not? It's part of their mythology. Could it be that at the time they came up with these 12 symbols, there were 12 real animals? No. Hmm? Here's one of the oldest pieces of pottery on planet Earth. It's a piece of slate from Egypt, first dynasty of United Egypt. It shows long neck dragons. We make replicas of it if you want to get one for a prize for your bus route for some to give out to the kid who does whatever, you know, you, they'll go crazy over this thing. half-size replicas of the oldest pieces of pot piece of pottery on Earth. Why would they put long neck dinosaurs on pottery 3,800 years ago? You ever consider the possibility that it was just artwork? That there isn't actually a dragon? I mean, again, if there is actually a dragon, if, if they are really real, we just need evidence of that. That's it. We need evidence, and that's something you have not provided us. Hmm. Here's two long-necked dinosaurs with a sheep in between their mouths. Here's a hippo tusk from the 12th century BC showing an animal with a long neck and a long tail. Doesn't mean that animal was real. There are all kinds of weird, bizarre, artistic designs on all kinds of walls everywhere. Doesn't mean it was real. It means an artist thought it looked nice. If it was real, you should be able to provide real, actual, tangible evidence of it. There's a cylinder seal showing what appears to quite obviously be long-necked dinosaurs. The Bible talks about a fiery flying serpent in Isaiah 14. Wait a minute, a fiery flying serpent? Well, if you read the story of Herodotus, Herodotus says he went to a certain place in Arabia, almost exactly opposite Buto, to make inquiries concerning the winged serpents. On my arrival, I saw the backbones and ribs of serpents in such numbers as it's impossible to describe. The winged serpent is shaped like the water snake. Its wings are not feathered, but resemble very closely those of the bat. The people where the bones lie at the entrance of a narrow gorge between steep mountains. The story goes that with the spring, the winged snakes come flying from Arabia towards Egypt, but are met in this gorge by the bird called ibises, who forbid their entrance and destroy them all. The book of Josephus talks about the fiery flying serpent that Moses... You know, he, he seems to be making it out like he... I guess what he's trying to do is provide evidence for this. I need actual evidence, not some pieces of art that people drew or whatever else. Show me the bones. You're making a very specific, direct claim. There were dragons, a.k.a. dinosaurs. There were dinosaurs all over the place as recently as 2,000 years ago, right? We should be able to find bones of dinosaurs everywhere. You know what we found recently? We discovered ancient Israelites were using cannabis in their religious rituals. We found, like, pieces of cannabis at altars in ancient Israel temples and stuff. That's an example of a piece of evidence that we use to, to determine the existence of something. We now know ancient Israelites used cannabis in some of their rituals. We should be able to find some piece of evidence to indicate what you're claiming, that dinosaurs were hunted to extinction just 2,000 years ago. There is not one shred of evidence for that claim. It is so completely unhinged from reality, I really don't know where to go with it. This came, had to kill when he came to the land of Ethiopia. And he ended up marrying the princess of the Ethiopians, and which is why his sister got mad at him later for marrying an Ethiopian. Not because she was black necessarily, but because of how this all happened. You read the story in Josephus' book. Anyway, in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, it talks about in 793 A.D. about the fiery dragons flying across the firmament. The Babylonian god Marduk has shown pictured on a fire-breathing dragon. You say, Brother Hovind, now you don't believe in fire-breathing dragons, do you? Yeah, I believe there were some. We cover all that in our videotape about Leviathan, but Job... How would that even work? 
I don't know how that would work. They have a flamethrower coming out of their mouth? Biologically, how would that happen? It's just, God, just everything about this is absolutely bizarre. Chapter 41 talks about Leviathan. It says, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke. You know, I've seen deacons do that at Southern Baptist churches. Okay, so that's no big deal. But uh, his breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Now, wait, wait, wait. Was there really a fire-breathing dragon? Well, you better... No, there wasn't. This is complete nonsense. This is conspiracy theory central. I love it. You know, in some of the previous seminars that we've watched, Kent Hovind has made a bunch of really weird, unhinged, bizarre claims about stuff like Noah being really, really big and building a gigantic ark as a result or, or whatever. Else. I mean, all of this stuff is fantastical and ridiculous and not connected to reality at all. But I really appreciate it when Kent really goes off the rails into some bizarre, bizarre stuff. Like Canopy Theory, that one's pretty weird. That one is weird. Uh, or, what was the one? Oh, yeah. Or dragons were real that breathe fire. Or when he gets into his idea that the government shouldn't run schools at all, people shouldn't be required to go to schools. I mean, or or his claim about vitamin B17, about cu how that cures cancer or whatever. I talked about that in a recent video that I just released. Just bizarre stuff, dude, and I eat it up. I am so fascinated by this guy's bizarre line of thinking. Like, bizarre line of thinking is a complete understatement, honestly. Was there really a fire-breathing dragon? Well, you better watch the Leviathan video about the fire-breathing dragon. But if you get a Catholic Bible, you find the book of Daniel has two extra chapters in it. It's part of the Apocrypha books, okay? Daniel 13 and 14. Very interesting reading, definitely. Yeah, Apocryphal books, when he says that, what he means is... I, I forget who exactly decided which books would go into the Bible. Um, I think the Catholic Church decided a lot of it. But anyway, originally, like many, many years ago. But some of the books... there We have other books that were contenders to be in the Bible. But I guess they decided not to include them for one reason or another. Matter of fact, and every book that was talked about being included originally that wasn't included, it's called Apocryphal. There's a book called The Wife of Jesus, I think, or something like that. Um, that was not included, so it's considered Apocryphal. But it very easily could have been. And honestly, there there's stronger evidence for some of these books. Or there's... There's stronger reason for the wife of Jesus to be in the Bible than for some of these other ones. The book of Revelation almost wasn't included in the Bible. And honestly, probably shouldn't have been. But was eventually anyways. So anyway, that's what he means when he says apocryphal. There are two apocryphal chapters of the book of Daniel, I guess. Uh, the people who decided on which Bible books and verses and chapters will be included, decided that the book of Daniel didn't need those two because they don't belong there, because they're not legitimate for one reason or another. So here Kent is talking about chapters of the book of Daniel that were not included because they weren't, because we couldn't verify their authenticity or, or some other reason like that. All right, so what's in these two Effectively, fake chapters of the book of Daniel. What's in them, Kent? Tell us. 13 and 14. Very interesting reading. Definitely not scripture. Okay. But in Daniel 14, it says, There was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him, therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. But give me leave, that's permission, you military guys know about leave, okay? And I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together and made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth and the dragon burst asunder. What a strange story. Let me give you the Hoven translation, okay? 
Yeah, so it sounds like, again, this could be completely fabricated. It likely is. Kent could have just totally made this up. But let's assume for a moment that he didn't. It sounds like the story is talking about a like a, a fire-breathing dragon, and Daniel went and slayed this dragon by cramming like flammable things in its mouth. And when the dragon tried to breathe fire on people, it burst into flame. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, it sounds like an old world children's book. Yeah, exactly, Scotam or Scotum. I agree. The Bible tells us that Daniel was a man who understood science. Those are the kind that Nebuchadnezzar took away at that time, okay? And Daniel would have known full well that pitch is made from tree sap and it's very sticky. Fat is salty tasting. And almost all animals like things that are salty tasting. And hair won't digest. So he made little lumps of pitch, fat, and hair, tossed them in. The dragon loved them, swallowed them, couldn't digest them. Oh, okay. I, I guess I was misreading it. I assumed what Kent was talking about, or I assumed Kent's interpretation was going to be it was flammable, and when the dragon tried to breathe fire on people, it, it, it burst into flame. But I guess he's saying he, he fed it non-edible foods, and that's why it exploded, apparently. Okay. And they plugged up his intestinal tract. And these were the days before Roto-Rooter, and so he burst asunder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you figure it out. Okay, anyway. Saddam bin Hussein, Hussein has quite a... This is a little joke that Kent is constantly doing. It is so cringy. He does the same thing with National Geographic. He says, National Pornographic, a geographic. It's like, okay, we get it. You have a problem with Nas National Geographic. Like, it's so cringy, dude. Please don't do that. Go problem. He thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein. I wondered, why does he call him Saddam? His name is Saddam. Well, Saddam means prince. Saddam means horse's rear end. Again, I don't know that this is true. Do not trust a word out of the guy's mouth. So he called him Saddam Hussein. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Saddam issued currency with his picture in front of Nebuchadnezzar. Saddam spent a fortune rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. But you know, ancient Babylon was discovered, buried in the dry sand over there. The bricks were just nearly perfectly preserved by the dry sand. So they excavated ancient Babylon and rebuilt it. Babylon was totally rebuilt in the last 20 or 30 years, I believe. Saddam put a brick about every 10 feet around the wall that says, I am Saddam Hussein. I have rebuilt Babylon the Great. I am a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. But on that wall, they found carvings of lions and carvings of dragons. Now, I can understand why they'd put a lion on there. I mean, we know about lions. But why would they put carvings of dragons on a brick wall 2,600 years ago? Because of mythology. The guy really does believe that dinosaurs lived with humans and humans hunted them to extinction 2,000 years ago. That's what he's trying to imply with this. Or outright saying, honestly. It's not even an implication. Uh, maybe because they knew about uh, dragons. Hmm? They're still there. You can go see them. A friend of mine was there. A soldier, he said, yep, they're still here. Dragons still on the wall from 2,600 years ago. Ishtar Gate is covered in them. Lions and dragons. Hmm. Yeah, I get it. There are dragons in mythology. There are also unicorns. Do you believe that unicorns are real? The Bible even mentions unicorns, just like dragons. There are, are all kinds of fantastical beasts of all different sorts. Do you believe in all of those because the Bible mentions them? The answer to that question is, yes, actually, he really does. He does. He believes in all of this stuff because the Bible mentions them. Yes, he believes in he believes in dragons and he believes dinosaurs lived with humans and were hunted to extinction. He believes in unicorns and all of the other crazy stuff he mentions here. Yes. Because the Bible mentions it exclusively. That is absolutely insane. Made a model of it for Dinosaur Adventure Land. If you want to come to Pensacola, that's a little closer to Iraq for most of you. But Alexander the Great said his soldiers were scared by dragons when they conquered part of India in 300 BC. This Roman mosaic shows two long necked dragons fighting or kissing. 
Now that would be necking. Wow. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> how does I don't know if the young kids in the audience are aware, but necking was something that evangelical or ultra-religious people used to do. It was scandalous, where you would rub your necks against each other. Uh, it was the step before kissing, which, of course, kissing is third base. Necking is first base. I'm sorry. Necking is second base. Holding hands is first base. So, in their eyes. So that's what Kent is referring to, if you guys were unaware. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> how, did, how did the Romans know about dragons in 200 AD? Saint how did they know about mythology that was already thousands of years old? Is that what you're asking? In 200 AD. St. George is famous for slaying a dragon in 275 AD. Beowulf slew two dragons and the third one killed him. You should try to read the Beowulf story in Old English. <laughs> Good luck. That's English. 1,500 years ago, that was English. I can only read one word on the page. It says, duh. <laughs> but anyway, when they translate the story to modern English, the story tells us Beowulf killed Grendel the dragon by pulling off one of its arms, and the creature bled to death. Pulled off his arm? Well, they found a Babylonian cylinder seal showing a guy pulling the arm off a dragon. When was Beowulf written? Of course, Kent is assuming that Beowulf is a real, literal, true story and doesn't recognize the genre of fiction, apparently. It was mostly... Uh, the most likely time for Beowulf to have been copied is the early 11th century, so roughly a 1,000 years ago, uh, give or take. This Babylonian cylinder seal... According to Kent's like source here, which I have no reason to believe it, but it says it's from 600 BC, which means it was 1,500 years apart between Beowulf and this cylinder here. Let me look this up. He called it after the flood. I have no idea what that's about. I'm not seeing this, actually. I'm not seeing this. I I'm looking this up. I'm not seeing it anywhere. Is this fake? Kentoven's... Thing, Kentoven's video here, it says, A Babylonian cylinder seal, 600 BC, question mark. After the flood, Bill Cooper, page 157. I searched for Babylonian cylinder after the flood, and it's not, I mean, it's showing Babylonian cylinders, but it's not showing this picture anywhere. It should have shown something like this, right? Babylonian cylinder, dragon, arm. I'm not seeing the thing that he made at all. I'm just not seeing it. Oh, here, wait, 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 wait. The Project Gutenberg ebook of Chaldean Account of Genesis by George Smith. What the hell is that? Chaldean Account of Genesis? So is this a is this a Chaldean drawing? Not actually a Babel, a Babylonian cylinder? Am I reading this correctly? I don't think that this is actually a Babylonian cylinder. Well, either way, Kent is offering little to no information on this. It sounds ridiculous to me. This is Kent Hoven we're talking about. Always assume it's fake. Right, exactly. Defeater of Huns. Owen, I really find your commentary invaluable, but how do you manage to watch this much of Hoven's material and not go mad? You couldn't pay me to stand there, watch this, and comment on it. I don't know. I find it fascinating. I find it really, really interesting, personally, to listen to him just make shit up whole cloth. Interesting. Get the book After the Flood if you want a whole lot more on dragons living with man. But there's a city in France that's famous because a dragon came up out of the water and a guy killed it and cut the head off and stuck it over the corner of the building. The head of the dragon was mounted on his building. They they, uh, that's, a, that's myth. That, that's called a myth. Not real. It's pretend. Does this guy not understand the difference between reality and fantasy why is it so hard for this guy to find that fine line between the two they called it the gargoyle how many have ever heard of the gargoyle they still do that today you can buy these ugly little critters you put them on your building or whatever over your door well the word gargoyle means throat we get our word gargle gurgle regurgitate gorge and glutton from that word it has to do with the throat 
So next time you gargle, you can think about slaying a dragon. You say, Brother Hovind, I am slaying a dragon when I gargle. Mm, okay, anyway. An Irish writer said they killed a dragon with iron nails on its tail. Well, Stegosaurus certainly had big spikes on his tail, that's for sure. Who said that? In 900 AD, an Irish writer told of an animal with iron nails on its tail and a head similar to a horse. It also had thick legs and strong claws. Interesting. Well, I mean, if that's true, we should find evidence of it, right? I mean, this is a, a real stretch, claiming that it was a stegosaurus that this guy was writing about. No evidence of that whatsoever, but... Even if it was that, we should be able to find evidence that the Stegosaurus was alive after a certain period of time. We should be able to find evidence that the Stegosaurus existed and was hunted as, as recently as 1,500 to 2,000 years ago, right? Not a lick of evidence for it. Doesn't matter to Kent. He's going to claim it anyways. Tails on its tail. Well, Stegosaurus certainly had big spikes on his tail, that's for sure. So did several other animals, but here's a Viking woodcut showing a dragon swallowing a guy. This is from the 11th century, a thousand years ago, okay? So he thinks a thousand years ago, dinosaurs were being hunted currently, actively. That is absurd on so many levels. The Vikings put dragon heads on their ships a thousand years ago. Why would they do that? Mythology. Well, they knew about the great dragon of the sea. They called it the Kraken. No, it was just mythology. Again, Bill Cooper's got a lot on that in his book, but uh, the famous Nor uh, Icelandic hero Siegfried slew the dragon Fafner. As a castle, bricks were found in a castle from the 12th century showing dragons. There's a 12th century castle in Germany with dragons on it. Why would they put dragons on their castles? Marco Polo lived in China for 17 years. When he came back, he said, the emperor is raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Why would he say that? Oh, probably because the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Mm -hmm. That's my theory. Yeah, okay. In 1611, they appointed the post of royal dragon feeder. Why do you need a royal dragon feeder? Uh, let me guess, uh, to feed the dragon. Mm. This guy really doesn't understand the difference between reality and fantasy. He really doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, okay. There's a 13th century castle with dragons on it. There's a gray from the 15th century showing, in, carved in brass, two long-necked dinosaurs. 16th century castle has dragons on it. We've got seven coins in our museum on loan. They're silver dollars from 1500s to 1600s, real silver dollars. All of them show somebody slaying a dragon. It was common 400 years ago. Everybody knew about slaying dragons. Of course, you've got to slay the dragon. You know, that's just standard procedure. Save the I think that's a euphemism for something completely different nowadays. <laughs> dragon, rescue the princess, or whatever. I don't know. But here's a Russian medallion showing a guy killing a dragon. Bulgarian postage stamp has somebody killing a dragon. The crest of Lithuania shows somebody killing a dragon. A city in France was renamed Nurluk to honor the man who slew the dragon. Indians carved dinosaurs on the walls of the Grand Canyon. Why would they put dinosaurs on the walls of Grand Canyon? Maybe because they hunted dinosaurs around there. Mm -hmm. You know, the interesting thing about all of this is that Kent Hovind must find an explanation for all of this stuff. Uh, you know, for dinosaurs existing and uh, for how the flood happened logistically and all of that. He needs to find a solution to all of this. It can't just be like, you know, it can't just be the scientific explanation because it's nonsense. Like, his whole story falls apart if he doesn't fill the holes in. We don't have to explain all of this stuff. Like, people in normal scientific fields, we don't have to explain all of this stuff to make an ideology work. It just is. We look at the facts. We look at the information. We understand, look, we found these dinosaur bones in the ground at this layer. We don't know how they got there. That's our starting point. We don't know. Kent Hovind's starting point is God did it. He has to find an explanation for this stuff. He has no choice. That's why he has to come up with all these fantastical tales, these fantastical uh, explanations 
for how all this stuff happened. He has no choice but to come up with bizarre, absurd ideas for how this stuff got there. In 1925, some guys took a raft trip down one of the canyons out west, and they wrote a report. They saw one of these dinosaurs, and they said the fact that some prehistoric man <clears throat> made a pictograph of a dinosaur in the walls of this canyon, upsets completely all of our theories. Oh, they upset his theories. Oh. Wait a second, let me step back. What did it say? The fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories regarding the antiquity of man? Facts are stubborn and immutable things. If theories do not square with the facts and the theories must change, the facts remain. Yeah, that's true. That's a, that's a factual statement right there. That's how this works. Facts remain. Theories change to fit the facts. The theories are formed around the facts. That's how this works. Um, but was this even written? Is this real? Published by the Oakland Museum of Oakland, California, the introduction... By Samuel Hubbard is dated January 6, 1925. So he's saying this was he's saying this was written in 1925. Is that right? They didn't understand how dinosaurs appeared on this cave wall or whatever else, on the Grand Canyon wall, whatever it is, in 1925. And as a result, somebody some scientific guy supposedly again, this could be completely fabricated too, for all we know. Some guy apparently said, facts are stubborn and immutable. If theories don't square with the facts, then the theories must change. Why is that such a big surprise? By the by, we didn't understand exactly how old mankind was or how old the Earth was in 1925. The science on this had not been fully developed yet. All of our theories. Oh, they upset his theories. Oh, no. Huh? He said about a year ago, a photograph of a dinosaur was shown to a scientist of national repute who was then specializing in dinosaurs. He said, it's not a dinosaur, it's impossible. Because we know dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on Earth. A year ago, a photograph of the dinosaur was shown to a scientist of national repute who was then specializing in dinosaurs. Okay, so it, it, he's claiming somebody showed, some rando showed a scientist a picture of a dinosaur, like a photograph of a dinosaur. And the, the, the scientist said, that is not a photograph of a dinosaur. They've been dead for 12 million years. That specific version. Or they were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on Earth. That's actually what he said. That's a sound statement. Uh, I don't know if Kent is aware of this. I'd be willing to bet he is. But there have been so many... Loch Ness Monster hoaxes. Photographs like that are not to be trusted at this point. There's a famous uh, photograph of the Loch Ness Monster. This picture is fake. Somebody took a toy, like a little, a tiny toy that floats, put it in Loch Ness, and took a picture of it and sent it to a bunch of journalists. It was a hoax. There are a billion Loch Ness Monster hoaxes like this. Photographs like that are not to be trusted. Too many hoaxes out there, honestly. If you have evidence of dinosaurs living in recent times, like as recently as a thousand years ago, you should be able to show us like the skeletons, the bones. You should be able to show us like what they ate and where they ate and all kinds of stuff. There should be mountains of evidence. For example, we know rabbits have existed since a certain time. Like, I don't know. When, when did rabbits... Okay, rabbits have existed for about 40 million years, right? And we can see rabbit skeletons throughout the entirety of the geologic column all the way up to that point. That's how we know, or one of the ways in which we know rabbits have existed for so long. We don't see that with dinosaurs. Their skeletons stop at about 65 million years ago. There's no evidence whatsoever that they existed past that point. None. Oh, hold on just a minute. Okay. First place, it's not possible for you to know what happened 12 million years ago. Okay, so let's just get that straight first up, okay? There is plenty of evidence to figure out exactly what happened 
12 million years ago or to find out the information that we need to know from 12 million years ago. Plenty of strategies to figure this stuff out. It's not as impossible to know as he wants you to think it is. Secondly, notice he said 12 million. Now, today the kids are taught dinosaurs died 65 million years ago. No, actually what he said was they existed 12 million years before man came to be on Earth. Now, what he meant by man is kind of up in the air. However, he is correct that this is an inaccurate estimate. Our, est our time estimates are getting more and more accurate as time goes on. Uh, there was a certain point in time when we thought 2 billion years is roughly how old the Earth is. There's another time we thought it was 200 million years. Uh, now we know that it was 4.54 billion years ago when the Earth was actually formed. At no point did we think in science it was 6,000 years. Well, it may be before the scientific method was created and we started cr critically examining the situation. It's only getting older. It is not getting younger. We are getting more and more accurate with our estimates and with our scientific methods to try to figure this stuff out. You know, 100 years ago, we could say it was older than 200 million years, the Earth. 50 years ago, we could say it's older than 2 billion years. Those statements are all accurate. It was. As time goes on, we get more accurate and specific. It was 4.54 billion years ago when the Earth formed. But he wants to make it out like the answer has changed throughout time. Like we have no idea what we're talking about and we just keep changing it. But the one immutable thing is the Bible. You can trust the Bible in everything. That's the problem with the Bible. It's immutable. The problem is that the Bible doesn't change when the information that we have through science does. The more specific we get, the more accurate we get, we get, the more facts that we gather, the less credible the Bible will be as a scientific manual. And that's exactly how things have played out through the years. The Bible is less and less credible as a scientific document. It's not a scientific document at all. It shouldn't be trusted as such, shouldn't be viewed as such. But Kent Hovind is viewing the Bible as a scientific document. It's ridiculous. Aren't they? 65 million years ago? It's interesting to see the inflation of the age of the earth. See, in 1770, <clears throat> they said the earth was 70,000 years old. By 1902, it was 2 billion years old. 1969, it was 3.5 billion years old. Yeah, you notice it's getting older as time goes on. We're... We never said it was 70,000 years old. We said it was over 70,000 years at the very least. It was a minimum of 70,000 years old. We're getting more accurate and more specific as time goes on. As we gather more information, more facts, we're getting more accurate. But again, Kent wants to make it out like we have no idea what we're talking about. We, ha we never had any idea, and we're just completely full of it, and we should trust the Bible. It's nonsense. Today it's 4.6. Did you know the Earth is getting old? No, it's 4.54. I just want to be accurate with this. Because he has a tendency to lie about stuff entirely too often. Today it's 4.6. Did you know the Earth is getting older at the rate of 21 million years per year? <laughs> That's 40 years per minute. Okay, it's aging rapidly, folks. Anyway, if you go to Blanding, Utah, you'll see carvings of dinosaurs on the cliff there. Apparently, they knew about dinosaurs in Utah. The Indians knew about them. They killed them, apparently. This is a cave painting in Australia <clears throat> showing a guy running away from what appears to be a dinosaur. I can't pronounce the name of this place in Canada, Mishap or something or other here, but it looks like these Indians have painted something on the cliff there that appears to be like a dinosaur with a dermal frill ridged on it. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm not really seeing it. You tell me if you see it or not. It, it doesn't really look like that to me, but I guess it could be. I mean, I, I guess it could be any number of things. Who knows? Doesn't mean dinosaurs existed. That, that's a logical leap of epic proportions. It's back. This is a painting from Australia. These guys are all dancing around what quite obviously looks like a dinosaur. 
Apparently, they're upset because it ain't their friend. Okay, there's the friend inside. You know, give him back, please, right now. Anyway. Um, yeah, there's a lot of mythology about dinosaurs and uh, dragons and all this other stuff. Like, th there's a, a ton of mythology about stuff. The Loch Ness Monster is not real. It was never real. It was a hoax. But people still believe it. Doesn't make it true because people believe it. I can't believe I even have to say this. This guy says nobody's ever seen a dinosaur. Well, why did they put them on their cave paintings? Why did they put them on ancient pottery? Why, did, why do we see so many legends of dragons if nobody's ever seen one? Down in Peru, they've got the driest desert in the world. It's only rained twice in 400 years, is my understanding. When the Spanish came across there in 1500s, they found white lines on the desert. They were obviously man-made. Somebody piled up the rocks. There's a pile of white rocks that goes sometimes for miles, straight as an arrow. These are today are called the Nazca lines. How many have ever heard of the Nazca images? They got all these. Again, like everything the guy says is a lie, it seems. I'm not convinced that these are even real. I've never heard of them. Uh, and he has a tendency to just straight up make things up. Sengir the second, or Sengir two, the Nazca lines are real and they're really cool to investigate. Interesting. That, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. I may have to look into that a little bit then. But yeah, it doesn't prove creationism. Doesn't prove that God created the earth 6,000 years ago at all. Images down there and down in Peru. You can study that if you'd like. But strange, these images are interesting. But one of them shows a spider which has no eyes and one leg is longer than the rest. And for centuries, everybody thought, well, these were poor, ignorant, stupid people. You know, they forgot to put the eyes on and they made the one leg longer by an accident. Recently, there was a spider discovered in the Amazon jungle a thousand miles away. Okay, I don't think anybody is saying that people are stupid and ignorant for, like, forgetting to put eyes on a spider, but all right, go on. It only lives in caves. It is extremely rare. It's supposed to be one of the rarest spiders on Earth. It's an eighth of an inch long, little tiny spider, lives a thousand miles away in the dark, in the caves. The spider has no eyes. And during mating season, that one particular leg grows longer and it exchanges DNA off the tip of that leg for 15 seconds. How did they know that in Peru, a thousand miles away? Well, how did spiders cross the Atlantic Ocean to get to America? You know how? It's actually really interesting. They build webs and basically ride on the webs like they're a raft. They'll even float through the air on their webs like rafts to travel across large gaps for real. Spiders are crazy, incredible creatures. They can travel massive numbers of distances, or massive distances. Uh, they can do all kinds of stuff. Scary, uh, I'm sorry, spiders are scary. Seriously, spiders are really, really scary creatures, like how capable they are. Uh, it's nuts. It's very possible, in fact, likely, I would say, assuming the story is true, which I'm doubting already, but assuming it is, it's very possible that the spider was not always just like bound to that area. It's possible that spider was in the other area where the people drew the picture originally, if the picture is even real. And then they went extinct in that one specific area. They had already traveled across the ocean a thousand miles away or whatever, and almost went extinct in the new place too. I mean, that's a perfectly reasonable explanation. I'm just throwing an idea out there. I'm not saying that's what happened. I don't know. I'm just saying God did it is not a reasonable answer. The answer, the correct answer here is I don't know, not God did it. Maybe they weren't so stupid after all. Hmm? Nobody called these people stupid. Anyway, in 1535, the Spanish conquistadors came through that area and they found stones with strange animals on them. They sent some back to the king of Spain and said, what on earth are these animals carved on these rocks? The king said, I have no clue. Today they're called the Ica burial stones from Ica. Oh my God, I know this story, the Ica stones. He talked about this in another part also. There's some guy that he always quotes when talking about the Ica stones. They discovered these Ica stones and didn't really know what they were. Well, the guy that he quotes, this evangelical dude, apparently believes that the Ica stones were like placed here by an alien species 
and the aliens created humans when they came like 50,000 years ago or something. I don't even know. It's just nuts, dude. It's really, really crazy. Dennis Swift is probably the world's expert on those. He's one of my good friends from Portland, Oregon. Yeah, I believe that's the guy. Um, I, I wouldn't call him an expert at all. I think he's just some evangelical nutcase that loves them, found a bunch of them and opened like some kind of a weird little museum so that people could go through his collection of them or whatever. And he's got some really bizarre beliefs about this stuff. Uh, this may be the guy. It may be another guy that started the museum. I'm not sure. But again, Kent talked about it in a previous part. So He did a great session at our boot camp in uh, 95. I mean, in 2005, our creation boot camp we have in Pensacola, Florida. And we've got his DVDs about him speaking on the Ica stones. Oh, it's incredible. You can still get those on our website. But these stones show dinosaurs on them. The Nazca burial stones from about the time of Christ, plus or minus a few hundred years. Some of them show brain surgery. They find brain surgery instruments, hardened copper, tempered copper instruments for cutting into people's heads, apparently. They, some of them show heart uh, surgery, limb reattachment, steam engine. One of them showed what looks like a steam engine. What looks like a steam engine. Fascinating. Okay. Was it a steam engine or not? I mean, you're saying it looks like it, but... When were these created? These were supposed to have been created like, I don't know, a thousand years ago or something. No, uh, they were discovered in 1966 by Javier Cabrera. More than 10,000 stones of various sizes are carved with intriguing images of a lost civilization. That's what the Ica stones are, basically. And Kent Hovind and his buddy here are convinced that it's proof that God is real because this lost civilization had dinosaurs and all this nonsense. Ica stones were found in Peru. They bear a variety of diagrams. Some of them supposedly have depictions of dinosaurs and what's alleged to be advanced technology. These are recognized as modern curiosities or hoaxes. In the 60s, Javier Cabrera Darquia began to collect and popularize the stones, obtaining many of them from a farmer named Basilo something or other. Uh, Yuschuya, Yuschuya, I think is the farmer's name. Yuschuya, after claiming them to be real ancient artifacts, admitted to creating the carvings he had sold and said he produced a patina by baking the stone in cow dung. How about that? They're fake. Uh, it's possible that some of them are real from my understanding, but this is a gigantic hoax. The guy who discovered them admitted to faking it. Again, some may be real. I don't know. But some most definitely were fake, at the very least. The Ica stones show dinosaurs with inaccurate anatomy. Also, you can see how it was traced from magazines. Really? That's fascinating. It's said that the locals, as soon as they found out the priest loved the Ica stones, they started carving them and bringing them to the priest. Wow. So it sounds like the Ica stones are just completely fake. I thought there was something to it because I hadn't re researched them before. The only mention I'd ever heard of them was through Kent Hovind. I guess they're fake. Fascinating. Well, it sounds like it's possible that that some of them are real, but we haven't been able to verify it. They have, in large part, been disregarded as hoaxes because the person who discovered them faked at least some. And now their credibility is shot to shit. We can't trust a word out of their mouths because they faked some of it. Um, that's, what it that's what I'm reading here. Okay, Kent. Well, continue telling me about these Ica stones. You've got my attention. Now that I know that they're completely fake or untrustworthy, entirely untrustworthy, you've got my attention. M reattachment. Steam engine. One of them showed what looks like a steam engine. Strange things are found on these Ica stones in Peru, but quite a few of them, over 500, I believe, show dinosaurs. Why would they have dinosaurs and humans on the same stones? Maybe it was a hoax. You ever consider that one? Oh, and you should know better than to believe anything that Hovind says is real. I know, right? I should have known better. 
That's my mistake. Well, because people lived with uh, dinosaurs. No. No. Even if those Ica stones were real, which they weren't, but if they were, it doesn't prove humans lived with dinosaurs. What are you talking about? Anyway, there's plenty on that. Here's one from our museum. Shows a dinosaur holding a guy by the head. This one we've got shows what appears to be a guy cutting the head off the dragon because the dragon killed his friend. You can see the friend's body is inside, but his head's missing. So his buddy's just doing what the Bible says. You know, vengeance is fine, saith the Lord. That's weird. That is weird and disturbing simultaneously. Something like that. But uh, this guy's jabbing one through the throat with a spear. This one's hard to see, but he's shoving the spear down the dragon's throat. This one, the dragon's got the guy by the arm, and apparently his spirit is leaving. He's flying off into heaven or wherever they go when they die in their culture, you know. What's weird about this whole thing is the fact that when were these discovered or supposedly discovered? Uh, 1966, okay. Uh, 1966 is when they were originally discovered. That was roughly 50 years before this seminar series came out, and it was well established by that point that it was a hoax. Well established. But Kent Hovind is using it as evidence anyways. Uh, and bizarrely, using it as evidence that dinosaurs lived with humans, of all things. It's just weird. This guy's got the knife stuck in the dragon's head. And the dragon's biting the guy. We've got eight of these stones in Pensacola, Florida. It's the largest collection in America, I believe. At $1,500 each. You know, not too many people have these things, but... Wow, dude. I cannot believe some poor fool paid $1,500 for a fake rock that somebody painted on. Some of and, and put on a fake patina by baking cow dung on. These things, but some of them show circles on the side. Now, that's kind of interesting. Why would they put circles on the side of the dinosaurs? Well, nobody ever found dinosaur skin until about 20 years ago. When fossilized dinosaur skin was found. Uh, dinosaurs had feathers. I don't know if the viewers were aware of that or not. Um, they had skin too, obviously, because feathers attached to skin. I'm just saying dinosaurs had feathers. They were feathered creatures. It's very interesting. The dinosaur skin has circle patterns on it. They had to see a live one to know to put that on the stones. Because you couldn't tell that from the bones. We got some dinosaur skin in our museum in Pensacola. Re Complete nonsense from beginning to end. Dinosaurs are 65 million years old. I don't think it's, I don't think any skin has been preserved, has it? No. No. They have not found unfossilized soft tissue from dinosaurs. To have something like that, it would have to have, uh, the dinosaur would have to have lived hundreds of years ago, maybe. Thousands of years, absolute max. Not 65 million. Did not happen. It's nonsense. It's fossilized skin, not soft. Fossilized skin. Okay, there you go. Soft dinosaur tissue? So now the brilliant scientists are trying to figure out how could tissue stay soft for 70 million years? Uh... I could be wrong here. I believe they did discover dinosaur DNA a while back. Okay, in 2020, this scientist and her colleagues reported the possible preservation of DNA in the skull of an infant Hypactrosaurus, I think, a kind of duck-billed dinosaur that lived 75 million years ago, found in Montana. The possible DNA was found in cartilage, the connective tissue that makes up the joints. Uh, that's my understanding. I remember hearing about it when it happened. Yeah, that's the. it looks like that's the only case of dinosaur DNA that we've found, and it was in the skull of... Uh, it looks like it was... I'm, I'm sorry, it was found in the cartilage and the connective tissue that makes up the joints of this dinosaur, apparently. Closest relative, they said, is the ostrich. Fascinating. Cracked open a femur, and that's when they found soft tissue inside the bone. Yeah, really interesting. 
the thought will never cross their brain to question that maybe it's not 70 million years old. I mean, that thought will never enter their head, okay? This guy's cutting the head off a dragon. There's a guy. We have solid evidence against that hypothesis. It's not younger than 70 million years. That's just what it is. By riding one. We got a ton of information on dinosaurs living with man. Sometimes they're in friendly gestures, like this one's petting him. He's got his head laying on his shoulder, okay? Pottery was found with dinosaurs on it. A mummy was found in a tomb wrapped in a blanket, and all around the blanket were dinosaurs. Why would they put dinosaurs on their blankets? Why would they put them on their pottery? Why would they carve them on cliff walls? Why would they put them on their waistbands? Because it's part of the mythology? Did you really not consider this? In Acumbaro, Mexico, 56,000 ceramic figurines of dinosaurs were found. They knew about them in central Mexico. They have always lived with man. They did not live millions of years ago, but everybody... This is weird because in the, I think maybe the last seminar, he made the claim that dinosaurs were just big lizards, like big salamanders, because reptiles, according to Kent, never stop growing. They grow forever. Uh, and the reason that they were gigantic, like dinosaurs were, is because of the oxygen-rich environment when the ice canopy was above the Earth, before the flood. So dinosaurs, according to Kent Hovind's crackpot conspiracy theory, dinosaurs were only gigantic and only existed as dinosaurs before the flood. But now he seems to be contradicting that conspiracy theory by saying that dinosaurs have always existed and they were actually completely different creatures or different species or whatever. So which is it? Were they salamanders that grew really big because of an oxygen-rich environment? Or were they their own species? The answer to that question is, whichever is most convenient for Kent Hovind in the moment. That's which it is. That's which one he goes with. Today is saying dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Nobody's ever seen one. Yeah, I think they have. Okay. An then prove it. Turn the person up. Show us who it is. And have them lead us to it. Until they can lead us to it or show us its bones or some other piece of evidence to indicate that they really did. It's nonsense and it's completely unbelievable. The peasant killed a dragon that was bothering his cows. They had it stuffed and mounted for a museum display in 1572. Hang on, what did he just say? Let me step back and listen again. Dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Nobody's ever seen one. Yeah, I think they have, okay? An Italian peasant killed a dragon that was bothering his cows. They had it stuffed and mounted for a museum display in 1572. Great, then we should be able to find that stuffed creature and examine its DNA, examine its hide, its skin, its everything, right? If it, if it really was stuffed and put in a museum, we should be able to examine that. Oh, we can't. We can't examine that. Is that what you're saying? By the way, you know why so many Italians are named Tony? Here we go. Years ago, they were shipping them to America, and they stamped on their forehead, to New York. Just so you know, that's not true. I, I just want to make sure we're all aware. Just a little bit of trivia there. but The Sutton artifact appears to show what it looks like a uh, pterodactyl with its wings folded up. This lady sent me this picture of the dragon found in uh, Utah. She said, Brother Hovind, looks like a dinosaur to me carved on the cliff up here. Roman artifacts were found in Tucson, Arizona. By the way, the Romans came across the ocean way before Columbus did. Columbus was not the first white man across the ocean. That's true. The Vikings were actually the first ones, they believe, across the ocean. It was like way, way, way be before Columbus. But what's this about the Romans? I haven't heard that. Maybe it's true, but again, I just trust everything Kent says by default. There was trade back and forth for centuries until the you know, Catholic Church kind of had the Dark Ages come in and shut down knowledge and information. But Brenda the Navigator came across in 500 AD. That's kind of interesting that he's talking like negatively about the dark ages right isn't that funny because that's kind of what he wants to bring us back to right in large part like he he just talked about how we shouldn't be sending our kids to school at all there shouldn't be public schools 
he's kind of trying to bring us back to the Dark Ages, and here he is talking shit about the Catholic Church for, like, perpetrating the Dark Age stuff. Weird. Roman coins, or Hebrew coins, were found in Ohio in a burial mound. There was trade back and forth at the time of Christ. I, yeah, I don't believe that for a second. Uh, that's incredibly far-fetched, but okay. Across the ocean. But in a Las Lunas uh, Decalogue stone here found in New Mexico, there's an 80-ton stone showing the Ten Commandments in Byzantine, which was only used about 500 A.D., is my understanding. Somebody came across, tried to evangelize America, made it as far as New Mexico 1,500 years ago. Uh, in, okay, 1,500 years ago. So he's saying in, like, 500, the 500s is when this happened? People were coming across the ocean trying to teach Christianity? No. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. Complete nonsense. But one of these Roman swords shows what quite obviously appears to be a dinosaur on it. Okay, do you have the artifact? This is just a drawing of an artifact with a dinosaur on it. Roman-style lead artifact excavated near Tucson, Arizona in 1924. How do we know it's not a hoax? Like, it's likely that... Ken Tobin has proven to us recently that he's willing to talk about hoaxes as if they're real. That, you know, that just destroys any credibility that he had. I mean, his credibility was destroyed for me, like, a long, long time ago, but that destroys it for this seminar episode. Every seminar episode, there seems to be some little thing he does that cripples the credibility that he had for each one. And I, I think that one was, the Ica Stones thing, that was the one that really did it in for this one. How on earth could they get dinosaurs on their stone, on their swords? At the time of the Roman Empire, during the age of sailing ships, there are thousands of legends of people sighting sea monsters. Well, if you're in a sailboat, it's kind of quiet going through the water, okay? With a, today, with a diesel engine, they can hear you coming 50 miles away underwater. Of course, you're not going to see one, all right? But there are legends all over of dra dragons living with man. I think we've really been lied to. We could spend a long time on dragon legends. I read uh, prolifically on that topic about <laughs> dragon sightings down through history. Just get our... Okay, dragon sightings and dragon legends are two different things. This Dragons aren't real, Kent. There's no evidence that dragons are real. I mean, this guy's trying to convince us that dragons are dinosaurs and they've lived among humans since as recently as a thousand years ago. Really? That's what he's doing right now. This is honestly, truly, like, melting my brain. As Blue Phoenix would say down through history. Just get our video number three if you want more on dragon legends. Did you know there are actually stories of giant octopus living in the ocean? I mean, like, really, really, really big octopus? I think he's talking about giant squid, and, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure giant octopus probably exists, too, but giant squid is the famous example, and the reason that we know that giant squid exist, or really, really big squid, are because, is be I'm sorry, it's because we've found gigantic beaks, and squid have beaks. So we know that they must be, I mean, based on proportions, we know r roughly how big these giant squid must be, based on how big the beak is. Aside from that, um, what he's getting into right now is something called cryptozoology. Now, if you weren't here for the first part of this, you will know that Eric Hovind specifically talks about the scientific study of cryptozoology in the very beginning of this whole seminar episode. Uh, this is his son, Eric, by the way. The of dinosaur fossils was thought to be a problem for creationists and for the biblical account of creation. Hi, my name is Eric, and what you're about to see is a powerful seminar that combines the last 30 years of research done by Dr. Hovind. It's not a doctor. In a field called cryptozoology. Which Dr. Hovind has been researching in the field of cryptozoology for 30 years. Just completely ridiculous from the ground up. And honestly hilarious, in my opinion. But there are legends all over of dra dragons living with man. 
I think we've really been lied to. We could spend a long time on dragon legends. I read prolifically on that topic about dragon sightings down through history. Just get our video number three if you want more on dragon legends. But you know, there are actually stories of giant octopus living in the ocean. I mean, like really, really, really big octopus. One octopus washed up on the beach in Florida. It was 200 feet across and weighed five tons. Like, this is such a trivial claim. But I am doubting every word out of the guy's mouth. I really am. I don't trust a word from him anymore. That's a big octopus. A whale was killed near Seattle. Inside the whale's stomach was one arm to an octopus that was 150 feet long. Whales love to eat octopus. Uh, what? Aren't whales... Uh, don't whales feed on krill exclusively? Do whales even eat octopus? Hang on, let me look this up. The majority of toothed whales will eat whale food species such as squid, octopus, crustaceans, and fish. So yeah, I guess it depends on the type of whale. Toothed whales will eat octopus, apparently. Interesting. Knowing is half the battle. And if a whale eats too much octopus, he'll get sick and puke it back up. And if you ever see a piece of puked up octopus floating around in the ocean, be sure to grab it. It's worth a fortune. Does anybody know what they make out of puked up octopus? Okay, this is the first time hearing of this. Perfume, that is correct. <laughs> that explains a few things, doesn't it, fellas? <laughs> hey, dear, you smell like a puked up octopus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and you can sleep on the couch for a month, too. <laughs> yeah. There are giant squids found out there in the ocean. I mean, really big squids. We could Again, this is getting into cryptozoology. There are very large squid. It's not this whole big conspiracy that the scientific like field is trying to cover up that these squids exist or whatever else. Like, they're certainly not as large as Kent likes to make out. Um, the the guy is completely full of it from top to bottom in every way, shape, or form. It's ridiculous. But let's continue. Spend a long time about that one. A giant squid washed up on the beach in New Zealand. They said it was a baby. Full grown, it would have been 150 feet long. People say, no, wait, 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 Hoven, if there are dinosaurs mentioned all through history, are dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible? Oh, yeah. A couple of times they do mention dragons, but I don't think they ever mention dinosaurs, never. Dinosaurs in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, we're going to cover that in the next session. Dinosaurs not only mentioned in the Bible, some dinosaurs might still be alive. We'll cover that in a minute. Oh, we're getting to Creation Seminar 3B. Fascinating. Okay. Needless to say, Kent is full of it on basically everything. Um, he just makes things up, just makes up false facts when the real facts don't fit his narrative. He will say whatever it takes to convince you that something is true. I cannot believe that this actually aired on TV, that this was actually played for school children at one point. In fact, it probably still is played for some school children, uh, certainly in private schools, certainly in homeschooling environments, it's played for them. And that just breaks my heart. 